Commissioners, you are live. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is rulemaking. We have a petition for rulemaking from Otto uh, and Director Lopez to introduce the subject. Is there anyone here today that would like to speak to this subject? Just one? Okay. Um, after we have the uh, introduction and questions from the commission to the director, then we'll take all um, public comment. It's not testimony or anything, but we will keep it very short, three minutes or less. Okay? And then we'll have further discussion from the commission. Thank you, Commissioner Acey. Uh, I will not restate the information that is in your packet. Uh, we have been asked to make a rule by, uh, by auto. Um, that is um, the Automotive United Trades Organization. Um, initially, they did not um, give us a proposed specific language, but they did subsequently give us an option for language. Um, the commission would also be able to use whatever language it chose if it were to decide to enter into a rulemaking activity. Uh, staff has recommended against entering into rulemaking for the following reasons. Um, first, um, we believe that um, this particular rule would be outside of the agency's authority. Um, as you're well aware, and some of the things I'm saying I know you know, but I want to make sure that we make a complete record. Um, an administrative agency is part of the executive branch. It's not supposed to be a lawmaking entity, um, nor is it a judicial entity. Now, over the years, agencies like this one have taken on some rulemaking, legislative activity, quasi-legislative activity, and some quasi-judicial activity in reviewing misconduct and reviewing uh, problems. But there's still a limitation on the type of quasi-legislative activity that an agency can engage in. And that is an agency can, um, make rules of general application. Agencies can make rules about what procedures shall be used uh, in front of it. And agencies can clarify terms that are in statutes. In this particular case, the request goes beyond that. Uh, the request actually would ask that the agency define public office to include tribal governments, which would be really asking the agency to amend the statute and secondly, would ask the agency to define public funds, which is a term of statute, in a way to include tribal governments in, um, in that, so that the funds held by tribes would be of the same nature as the funds held by counties, cities, and the state. That would be a substantive definition. It wouldn't be a, um, it wouldn't be a procedural matter and uh, it is beyond the agency's rulemaking authority. If an agency does uh, create a rule that is outside of its authority, it can expect to be challenged in court, or it can be challenged by the legislature itself. And I would think that either of those would be likely outcomes. Auto raises a legitimate question when it brings up the fact that there are significant money influencers in our political process, but the influencers of the tribes um, is really no different than the influence that any other group has been playing. I did some research yesterday on current matters uh, that are on uh, money being raised for 2016 elections. Uh, we have ballot initiative packs that, uh, such as Carbon Washington that has $868,000 raised, Integrity Washington, which is the group behind the possible ballot initiative to um, 
moved to public financing of campaigns, they've raised $250,000. Uh, there's one that's a two-thirds for taxes constitutional amendment pack. They've raised $206,000. Continuing PACs, those are political committees that exist year after year and raise money to engage in political activity. The total continuing PACs in 2016 have raised $14 million, 114, over $14 million. They've spent over a million, so we can expect to see a lot of money being spent on campaigns this summer. Uh, two PACs, the highest uh, ones reporting at the moment, continuing PACs, Washington Realtors, Realtors PAC, has 1.5 million. Washington Education Association has 1.3 million. In our biggest statewide races, uh, Governor Inslee has over $4 million in his campaign account. His challenger um, for the Republican Party, Bill Bryant, has 1.1 million. Bob Ferguson, who's the only candidate for AG right now, has already raised $963,000. So money in politics is a reality. It's something we deal with every day. But money in politics isn't something that this agency regulates. Uh, I think a good example of that is that the Grocery Manufacturers Association, which spent over $13 million fighting the GMO labeling law in 2013, we've been in litigation with them ever since, not because they spent $13 million, but because they never registered and they didn't report it. So the money is a factor. The money alone shouldn't be a factor in this agency deciding whether to take action. I also have concerns about the agency's capacity for complex rulemaking. As you can see from the number of comments that have been received simply on this request, this is an area that is uh, very controversial. It arises passions. People care deeply about both money, politics, and tribes. Um, that would make for a very robust and challenging rulemaking process. The staff who would be engaged in that rulemaking process are me and Lori Anderson. We have 18 employees in this agency. Five are the IT staff. Three are the data entry and customer service staff. Five are the investigative staff. Doesn't leave a whole lot to handle something like this. So it would be me and it would be Lori. And we've already planned our activities for the summer to do some of the things that need to be done in accordance with our strategic plan. There are other timing considerations. In a normal rulemaking, uh, a rule that would go into effect after June 30th that would be uh, applicable to campaigns and elections would not go into effect. We have a moratorium on rulemaking if we can't get it into effect by June 30th. The only way a proposed rule would come into effect before June 30th would be if the agency adopted an emergency rule. An emergency rule can be adopted where necessary to preserve health, safety, or general welfare. Uh, it would not be my opinion that uh, anything having to do with campaign financing was necessary to preserve health, safety, or general welfare. So an emergency rulemaking is, is probably not an appropriate type of rulemaking to consider which would mean that if the agency chose to enter into rulemaking, there would not be a rule in place in time for the 2016 election. All of these were my reasons for recommending against entering rulemaking on this subject at this time. Questions? Director? No. So we will take public comment now. Um, I have my handy dandy timer here. So come up, come forward, and please state your name for the record. For the record, my name is Tim Hamilton. I'm the executive director of Auto. I started it in 1984 after I visited the Public Disclosure Commission in this building. I'm a grassroots lobbyist. I'm a small businessman. My people have gasoline stations. I'll try to do this as fast as I can, but it can take a little bit. With all due respects, we disagree with almost every point the staff has just made. The APA gives us a right to petition for a rule. It anticipated that we would have a rule, could be opened, CR 101. I've done this for 35 years, by the way. The CR 101. Then 
you would have a rulemaking stakeholders process where people would have to be all inclusively posted on the federal state register and ability to call in. We didn't have that here. We had a private exclusive rule uh, process between the governor's office and the staff and the tribes and myself. Uh, that's not what we envisioned. You, 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 you are, you're now asking decisions on legal matters that we don't agree with at all. Um, and when you come to the point with staff, uh, I deal with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, the agriculture, with everything in our business, and we're all stuck with lack of resources. But if you could use the argument that you have to have excess staffing and, sur and surplus budget before we could exercise our right to file for a petition, it, you, you, would, you basically eliminated our rights to ask for a rulemaking process. We wanted to go forward in a, in, in a prospective fashion. Could we have filed complaints? Could we bury buried this department with complaints? Could we enter into litigation? We've been to the Supreme Court twice in the last five years over some of these issues. And yes, we didn't want to do that. We wanted this process to find the solution. The, the CR 101, CR 102 process has a stakeholders process where he actually instructs us to seek consensus. I got friends who've taken campaign contributions from tribes. I don't want to choose them on improper behavior. And in our laws, like it or not, short budget or not, this is the body we come to. It is why I believe Jolene and the rest in their basement passed that initiative was because it would be citizens such as yourself without a vested interest in campaign contributions or employment that where we could come. I summarize by saying the statutory policy is unambiguous. In Washington, governments cannot uh, contribute to political campaigns. Tribal governments seek to be treated as governments in a variety of aspects under Washington law. And Otto agrees that insofar as they are governments, the PDC should adopt a rule that clarifies, clarifies that tribal governments as governments fall within the policy. The eventual rule that Otto would like to see the uh, commission adopt, and by the way, you may adopt something I don't like at all, but you have to go to the dance before you, you can do it. It's just that eventually, it, it, would not limit in any way the right of tribal members or tribal businesses to participate or make contributions in the political process. They, like all non-tribal citizens, can continue on. It's only tribal governments that are affected and when tribal governments try to influ influence non-tribal elections. Finally, this issue can go away in our mind and be resolved through the rulemaking process in the least expensive, most efficient fashion, we know you have to respond to us within a certain time frame for a CR 101 up or down. After that, there's really not a, a pressing, driving you've got to do this this day where your staff can't prioritize budget and prioritize this role as we go forward. And we asked you, give us an avenue that is the most efficient and the least costly and the least prohibitive to, this, to, to the PDC and to us. Do not pit the state's treasury against a citizen's fault. Please don't do that because it will not go away until it's addressed and we believe you can do so if you just get the information. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Commissioners? Um, just a, a procedural. Uh, there, there, the comments suggested that there was a disagreement about whether we had followed the appropriate procedures for how we had gone about this. Can staff comment on, on that on the last bit? Yes, um, there's a difference between the process when an outside entity is petitioning an agency to engage in rulemaking compared with the process of normal rulemaking, which is initiated by an agency um, with the filing of a CR 101 and provides for um, 
public hearings, public comments, and a, and a whole process. Uh, where we are with this request is really sort of in the almost a pre rulemaking process, and that is that uh, the outside entity auto has come to the agency and said, we think that there is a rule that you should consider adopting, and we would like you to enter into the rulemaking process. The agency then has 60 days by statute to decide whether to begin rulemaking, and the options are yes, start the rulemaking process, no, decline the rulemaking process. If the agency declines to begin rulemaking, um, Auto does not have a, an administrative remedy to pursue on that, but they could go to Superior Court under the Administrative Procedure Act and say, this agency has taken administrative action with which we disagree. We would like to file a petition for judicial review. Now, compare that to if Auto had come to the PDC to request that we amend an existing rule or repeal an existing rule. If you request an agency to amend or repeal a rule and the agency declines to do so, then there are review options with the governor's office and with the jailer. It's a joint legislative audit review committee. Thank you. Thank you. What's R? Um, so it is a different process. It's an unusual process. It, it usually uh, agencies make their own decisions about rulemaking. Now they may hear from constituents over the course of uh, the year or period of time that there are issues or problems and the agency then may decide let's do something about that. Um, one of the concerns that was raised in some of the material was this seemed like a very quick expedited process. It was. The agency has 60 days to gather whatever information it can to determine whether to move into the rulemaking process. For the reasons that I've set forth earlier, it is staff's recommendation that this agency at this time not begin rulemaking on this subject matter. That doesn't mean it couldn't be taken up at some other time, but right now is not the right time. That, that's that's sort of the staff opinion on this. So, um, capacity uh, or lack thereof, setting that aside for a moment, I, I'm interested in the issue of scope and authority. We got quite a bit of I mean, testimony, if you will, in, in public input on this request. Um, has there been, is there any legislative history here? Has there been an effort to do this legislatively rather than doing the field? Um, I am not aware that there has been um, any effort to legislatively uh, add tribal governments to the category of um, public officers, similar offices, similar to counties, cities, et cetera. Um, and I, I don't believe there has been a prior effort to define uh, public funds in a way that would um, go beyond the type of funds uh, raised or held by the state, counties, cities, uh, offices of those of that sort. So I, I don't believe that this has been addressed legislatively. Just to reiterate and clarify from my mind, um, we're still kind of in the preamble of whatever rulemaking there is. And today, our objective is to decide whether to move forward with rulemaking with this or um, not, and whether it is within our purview, whether it is not, could be one of the reasons we go forward or not. Yes. I think that an agency that is looking at a request to begin a rulemaking process, the first question the agency would ask is, is this within our uh, scope of authority? The second question might be, um, is this the right time for us to be engaging this activity given any other um, 
capacity issues. And, and again, um, the agency's not foreclosed from picking up this issue at some future time if, there, if there's a desire to do so. It's really in this kind of forced consideration of a, of a 60 day period um, that, that we've been in. Although I guess I would disagree a little bit in my own view that it, and I'll just state it on the record, I think it's beyond the scope of our authority to do this. I think this is a matter of statutory interpretation and it's, it is more appropriately handled legislatively. So for me, it's not a matter of today versus tomorrow. It's a matter of whether this goes beyond our authority. And if we exceed our authority, then uh, what follows from that um, has quite a bit of potentially unintended consequences as well for the agency. So I'm reticent to go down the path uh, or to even open the door to suggesting that we might, that it's just a matter of timing. I think that's true. I mean, I, I so I'm sort of playing devil's advocate here with, with myself maybe, but I think the agency could um, open a rulemaking um, even if it had questions about whether there was a, an appropriate rule. I don't think many agencies would do that because again, why would you spend the time and resources on something that you felt was outside the scope of your authority? So I think you're right. I think that if, if you have the concerns about the scope. Several of the um, commenters have raised that issue. That's an issue I've raised. Then if it's not an appropriate subject for rulemaking, it's not an appropriate subject for rulemaking. I don't know why you would go further. If you if you were uh, considering going further, you could also look at other uh, issues that would weigh on whether to engage in rulemaking. I can never say your name right. I apologize. Mike, it's butchered constantly, so I feel your pain. I need to do it to me. Those are the G's and you got it. What is the wish of the commission? I will say the commission does have to make a decision, yes or no, by April 1st. Well, I'm prepared to make a motion. Why? Okay. Well, so uh, I would move that we not enter into rulemaking uh, on this petition as requested. Uh, the, the subject matter of the petition and uh, issue on the table does exceed our scope and authority and is more appropriately handled legislatively. It's been moved and seconded that uh, this commission does not move forward with rulemaking on this item. Any further discussion? I just remark I see the issue um, but I in the, my non-legal mind, being the one non-lawyer up here, it seems to me that it is beyond the scope of our ability um, and our authority to work on this issue for you. Yeah, I think that's correct. And Chair, the, uh, the definition of public office is set forth in the statute. We don't get to write the statutes. We don't get to amend the statutes. The legislature has to do that. So I'm not convinced that we would be entitled to create a law to, I think, by rulemaking, change the statute. Um, that's the thing that the legislature reserves to us. I think it's very angry the commission's tried to. Well, I would say there are a number of other areas where we have seen, we don't think the public is as well served as it could be, and we would like to have that addressed. And each one we've had to defer and try to fix it legislatively. So this is not a unique position we find ourselves in. I agree. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And opposed? Motion carries unanimous. And with that,
that, we have um, to move on to reporting modifications. Jennifer, you are here. Thank you. We only have one today. Thank you very much. This is the reporting modification request for a candidate for state representative in the 43rd Legislative District. It's Daniel J. She. He is asking to not disclose the customers of a law firm in which he is an attorney. He is an attorney with Sussman Godfrey LLP. Um, he does have a very small ownership. Um, he's indicated uh, that he has provided a list disclosing his clients, um, his clients, the clients whose interests would be significantly affected by his actions if elected, um, clients who are identified in court files or other public sources, and the firm's governmental clients. Um, these were attached with his request and with his financial affairs statement, and this is consistent with the um, previous protocol for um, filers who are requesting a relief from disclosing those clients according to um, what is just, I'm sorry, the previous protocol and what is now in the rule. And the rule is WAC 398-28-100-1-E-I. Any questions for Jennifer? If not, is there a motion? I move that the commission uh, grant the, this is a partial, right? Yes. Partial uh, modification is requested on the basis that the rural application will cause a manifestly unreasonable hardship on the applicant and a limited modification would not frustrate the purposes of the act and appears he's complied with the uh, now rule on the formal reporting correctly. That is correct, yes. A second. Then moved and seconded to uh, approve the modification as stated. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. And opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much, Jim. If I can have just one moment longer, um, Commissioner Levinson, you had requested um, in the end of 2015 that some additional information be added to the cover sheet. Um, I tried to capture what I thought was your request in the section that's titled Explanation of Rule. You had indicated that there wasn't quite enough information on the cover sheet for you to identify what the rule actually said. Um, if this is sufficient, great. If it's not, I would like your feedback so that I can provide it in the next meeting. Or anyone else's um, additions as well. So. Thank you very much. This brings us to our uh, executive session working lunch, uh, where we will have a discussion of matters allowed in executive session pursuant to RCW 42.30.110, including but not limited to discussion of enforcement matters pending a potential litigation with legal counsel and a review of performance of public employees, possible action regarding pending litigation or other matters properly discussed during executive session may be taken following the executive session. And we will return at 1.30. Oh, 1 o'clock, excuse me.